Lee and Zoe who unfortunately, unfortunately can't be here, here with us. You are now being recorded, so <laughs> if, if you don't like it, maybe give it a thought. So, are you all good? Sure. Okay then, uh, maybe I'll share my screen. Entire screen. And I'm live. Actually, it was not 2.3, but actually 2.4. I, I made a mistake when sending a message. Yeah, this section was about posing a linear transformation and how that works when you operate in norm space. Uh, the, the basic identity that the section starts with is that if you have composition of, of operators, the, the norm is bounded by product of both operators. This means that you can have a, the composition works like a product, as in the matrix product, and that make, makes the set of bounded operators what's called an algebra. You have Basically, it's basically a vector space with a product between vectors. And this allows us to do quite a lot of interesting things. Um, skipping to the interesting bit, but the, the most important part is that, okay, we can have the inverse of an operator and we can call something the inverse, have a bunch of properties for the inverse. Um, towards the end of the section is a bunch of the uh, we call the Neumann series theorem, here being uh, Karl Neumann, not uh, John von Neumann. But yeah, the, 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 I, mean, I guess the, the Neumann series theorem here is the big, the important theorem, which is, is a callback to real analysis, where if you have a real number with uh, absolute value smaller than one, then the, the power series of that real number uh, converges to one over one minus x, and in terms of operator, if we have a, uh, a bounded operator with, with a norm smaller than 1, then the power series of that operator also can inverse of 1i minus a. A bunch of things, and yeah, th this is all of the neither operator, and I, I think I remember from seeing it in course that finite dimensions, one way to prove this is that uh, you have like a you have a, a theorem that says the 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 power the, so the you take your matrix to the nth power n plus one where n is the dimension then the the n plus one is sort of a, a linear combination of the powers from one to n minus one n yeah that's more less interesting. Yeah, so the, the Nomen theorem is the, is the big one, and a bunch of exercises that get into. Then the, the next meet is that, okay, we can take a series of operators and they converge, and uh, then an interesting thing that we can do then is take consider what's the exponential of operator. And if we take the exponential to be in the, the Taylor series, then that uh, take literally the, the Taylor series from real analysis and apply it to just our operator and it basically works the same. And what's interesting with the exponential of an operator is that if we have a linear ODE, uh, so x of x dot equal a of x where a is our linear operator, then the solution can be expressed as can be expressed as the term of the exponential operator. So in a real sense the exponential exponential of operator uh, the exponential of an operator is pretty important in when you solve PDEs. Actually, take the one way to see it. For example, if you have the uh, heat equation, so the operator is uh, squared over the x squared. So second derivative, then the exponential is the solution to that. And if you think of this in terms of uh, skipping ahead to the next section a bit, but Think of this as in terms of uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Then, the eigenvalues of the 
uh, the second differential are the Fourier functions, and then the, you just amount to take the you keep the eigenvalues, but you take the I uh, the you took, sorry you keep the eigenvectors, but you take the eigenvalues and take them to the exponential, and because you have uh, negative eigenvalues for the second derivative, this means that they all converge to zero exponentially. I have a question about these power series. Yeah. Do you typically uh, always get the same radius of convergence that you would for the real value power series? Uh, I think that's tricky. I guess so. I'm not certain off the top of my head. Uh, I think there are also a lot of subtleties with the norm you have. If you take another operator norm, then all, all of a sudden your then uh. Like your your criterion for convergence, like because when you take a different norm, what it means to converge means a different thing. So we can have. I, I'm not sure the radius of convergence has the same tuition as it would have in the real case. There's a bit of care to be had here, but I think. If you have a function that's always convergent, then, for example, as for the exponential, then you have no problem. But if you, your function has a certain radius of convergence, I'm not sure how to how exactly the jumping from real case to operator case where you have a norm that's not uh, equivalent because not all the norms are equivalent. You can have some funny stuff going on. Uh, but yeah, an, an, an important property actually of the exponential of operator is, is is that if your matrix can be, or operator, but in the finite dimensional case at least, you have matrix that's diagnosable, so you have uh, a basis of eigenvectors and eigenvalues, then your um, exponential operator is just the, you take the exponential of the eigenvalues and ex the um, eigenvectors stay the same. But if it's not the case, then you're sad, but you can still express it. So I think that there's an exercise at the end of it. Uh, yeah. This line here is the general matrix exponential for a matrix. Yeah. The, 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 the cool stuff about all this is that well, we get the hint that if you have a function that you can express as a Taylor series and you have an operator and you can have a good definition of what it means to apply that function to that operator and it's sort of meaningful. For example, we can take the sine or cosine of an operator and it makes sense, especially in terms of the matrix exponential. So, yeah, any questions? So that's sort of a brief uh, reminder of the chatter. Or maybe do we want to jump in with the exercises? Yeah, that might be good. By all means. Kaden, so I think you, you, you had both tried the uh, 220, right? Which one is 220? So, so the first one of the section, if I can find it. My mouse is a bit um, finicky, so yeah, there you go. Vertibility of a diagonal operator, so it says if you have a bounded sequence in K and we consider the operator that's in L2, all L2, it just multiplies element-wise, but by uh, our own sequence, then our big lambda operator is invertible if and only the infinimum of uh, our lambda is strictly larger than zero. Right. Why? Did you guys both did that one? Yeah. So. I guess the, the if direction, um, you can kind of just construct the inverse, because you just um, basically have the operation where you multiply by 1 over lambda um, i instead of um, 
by lambda i. And then the, and the only, only if, if direction. You... Oh, yeah. I, Sorry, I go ahead. You just, you just construct the same thing and show that it's not continuous because the operator norm is the soup of the one over lambdas. Which yeah, pretty much. It sort of hints. Lambdas. Yeah, that, that basically it, it sort of hints that the the norm of the inverse responds to the infimum of the. So if if like if we take the norm of our operator is the sub over all x's of uh, p of x, it's primum. But the, if we take this infimum instead, we'd have what essentially is the uh, inverse norm norm of the inverse operator. It's sort of an bit of a. I think it's an important part. Important part to have it as, as an intuition is that, like the reason this matters is about that. Say you actually have like one of these lambdas be zeros, then it's it's obvious that it's not invertible, right? So, but it's not necessarily that. Uh, We don't necessarily have to have a, a lambda be equal to zero to have a problem before lambdas converge to zero, then still have a problem. And yeah, back back to the idea that the norm of the inverse is the inverse of the infimum of the uh, take the definition of the norm, place the sub by an inf, take the inverse of that, and that's the norm of your inverse operator if it exists. Bit of an I think to keep in mind, especially the later sections when we go to spectral theory, because this directly jumps, uh, like relates to the eigenvalues. Yeah, I think the, maybe 2.21 is a bit easy, so maybe you can skip it. It's just a bunch of algebra, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 2.22 is uh, the first one that's a bit chunkier. That's a lot of math. Okay. Comments right now, so yeah, the, the first one was, was somewhat reasonably easy, right? So, show yeah, I'm trying to remember it because it was it's a while, it was a while when I did this one. Yeah, we take the trace of a matrix, it's just sum of diagonal elements, and yeah, for, for the sum, it's easy, for the product, it's easy. And the goal here is to prove that we cannot have A and B in. Uh, matrices such that such that the commutator so a b minus b a was i yeah so it back to the idea that the commutator cannot be large and yeah i don't know if you had suggestions for how to do that so i get the the trace of a b minus b a this oh uh, yeah i guess you can just take the trace of both sides and on the left side you get zero and on the right hand side exactly. you get d using the yeah. laws that are given in the question yeah pretty much um yeah exactly um for the next one then ah we suddenly we're not really in matrix space anymore so it's a bit complicated but we show okay we have a b minus b a equals i or this definition, then you can have a bit of a complicated. Um, basically, it, or this should already scream to you of oh, uh, prove by induction. I'm, I'm trying to f remember it without uh, just showing my notes, because that, <laughs> that would be boring. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I think the trick for this one was um, first of all for the n equals one, this is true. Yeah. And then for the other case, you have to uh, yeah, I think we had the the I think the way I did it was multiply by b 
on both sides or really no take this a, a and, and yeah a a b to the n minus b to the n a sort of factor it that i get in, basically i yeah i factor a b out on both sides and do some algebra to get back the a b n minus one minus b n minus one a and plus some other stuff and after some simplification we get the desired uh, term on the other side uh, but the important part is okay we take the, the norm on both sides you can sorry um Take the norm. This becomes smaller than norm of a. Yeah. So take the norm, the sum. We, we take the use the triangle equality for the sum. And the product rule. So it's smaller than the norm two times the norm of a ten uh, times the norm of b uh, power of n. So that. If it were the case that a b minus b a were equal to i, I would have, I think, a, a divergence. It would have a something that keeps growing at least, or either grows or goes to the zero, whereas the i should keep have norm one. So that's how this part goes. Maybe I'll check that part because. Okay. A bit more. In Wait, I, <laughs> I think I'm still on the induction part for the first step. So, I mean, yeah, I, I have it right here. So, sorry if I'm going yeah. fast. Yeah, no, so. I'll, I'll get. Yeah. But yeah, you still have to. Yeah, that's and what I. Things. Okay. Take the operator norm. We have yeah, right. We have this simplification here. Yeah, okay, so the 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 weird stuff is that we have the norm, the the product of the Norms of a and b smaller than n for any n, so something's gonna give here, right? Because norm of a and norm of b should be finite, so when you have n on underneath, then means at least one of them is infinite, so you have a. Yeah, I think here if you assume that b is bounded, then we have a a unbounded or whatever, so. Sure. And the last one, that whole function f. And yeah, we have this operator. Yeah, so this is yeah, this is a counter example where the you have a a here is the derivative so. Here the the, the, the the important part is because it's it, because the derivative it's not bounded. That's it's why we have this uh, counterexample because we don't have bounded operator. I, I I'll I'll let you guys maybe work that one out. Difficult. So yeah, moving on. I think two point uh, two point twenty three is a bit boring. I mean, it's a lot of algebra. So yeah, unless you good. really, really want to do it, uh, okay, I, I don't Maybe recommend it. The 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 interesting sure. part is the uh, the program because you, you get to actually try applying the sort of uh, the series definition. And I mean, 
I, I'm surprised that they say you no, know, the slow conversions of the Neumann series. For me, it seemed pretty pretty fast. So, mm. yeah, the conversion to like 60 iterations. So maybe I did something wrong. I don't know. But yeah, it's mostly just basically linear algebra and actually just writing a program and. Um, let's see. Ah, oh, this, this, yeah. I don't know if you guys prefer either 2.24 or 2.25. I know Uli uh, had some had some questions about 2.25, so maybe we'll at least look at a solution for that one. But uh, I don't know which one you guys prefer. The the 2.24 is not too hard, but it's One one trap which I fell into is that I hadn't noticed it was exponents of two, the a. So I thought it was oh one plus a plus one plus a squared plus one plus a cubed etc. But no, it's uh, powers of two. Any preference or two point twenty five? Wow, we have a lot of listeners. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, 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 does the audience uh, of listeners have a preference between a short exercise using induction or a longer exercise using some not too hard algebra? You have to choose. Let's go with two twenty five. I feel like that's yeah, the sure educational yeah. one. Yeah, so. This one is a bit of a callback to the, if you remember the exercises where we shows using the determinant that the set of closed matrices, the, the, so the set of non-invertible matrices is closed, using the, the fact that uh, non-invertible matrices have determinant zero, and zero is a closed set, so it's um, inverse, uh, so it's re reciprocal is also a closed set. And here we show the opposite. Okay, because the uh, non-invertible uh, maps are closed, then the, of course the uh, invertible ones have to be uh, open. This is what we show here, but using the topology norm. So actually, here the the trick is to actually just use the definition. Um, but of course, it's not super easy. So the way I did it was okay. Let's say I have an A. Operator A, which is uh, bounded and invertible, and I want to find the radius around A in the, in the operator norm that, uh, such that every operator in there is uh, invertible. And yeah, one thing, to, one way to think about it is that I want to. Sorry, I, I maybe won't show the solution. Right away, but if you can imagine uh, factoring a minus b, so the, the the trick here is that we want to try find some way to use the the, von, the Neumann series theorem. We want to find a ball such that we can get some operator with norm uh, strictly smaller than one in the end. So I basically decide, okay, let's suppose I have an operator that's expressed as a plus some operator, or maybe more exactly, I want A plus C times A. So that's the so B is A plus C times A, or maybe it's A times C. I don't remember. And then the the norm, so the the B minus A, so the the the, the actual vector that's in our ball. Would be uh, C A, and we want, to say, we want to find some radius so, such that the norm of C A is definitely smaller than one, so that we can apply the series theorem. And yeah, if you do some work with that, you find that uh, a nor uh, a proper radius that you can use is the inverse of the norm of A. Goes back to the first exercise we did where we 
No, it's, it's, it has to be an infimum. So we look at this. So this is basically what I did, right? I say, okay, suppose B is expressed as this, so A minus AC, and we want the norm of AC is more than the epsilon. And the thing to note here is that if we have the norm of C strictly smaller than 1, then B is definitely invertible with B minus 1 being simply 1 minus C, I minus C inverse, A minus A inverse. And uh, we can always construct C from B and A. So the, the, all that's left here is just finding a proper condition on C such that uh, the sorry we need to find a, a norm of a minus b which is the radius we're looking for such that the um, norm of ac is more than one yeah the trick for that is just take the inverse of a inverse and it works and the Second, that's the sort of the easier part of the the problem. Then the second one is actually showing that taking the inverse is a continuous operation. And I I'm, I don't think I'll show you the solution for that one, but it's once you have the the sort of trick of building this C operator as the operator, you just have to find okay, want to find I already know a radius such that for any uh, t zero. Uh, invertible, I can find. Um, yeah. here, here it's a typo, it's a GL for the invertible. We already have for the first one, we have a radius around our operator such that anywhere in that ball it's definitely invertible. Then on top of that, we have just another condition such that we want the, and a bound of the difference of the inverses. And Basically, the, the, what this part amounts is just combining the two. So you, from, you have the first bound, and from doing algebra on that second part, you have second bound, and you just have to take the minimum of the two bounds, and you're definitely good. That seemed maybe clearer. Right, so on this one in part two, I got as far as rewriting t inverse minus t o t zero inverse as something like uh, something like t minus t zero with one of those operators on either side. Yeah. Um, then the one that is t inverse, I can just replace that with operator uh, the the inverse of the rearrangement that you showed before. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and then if you, yeah, you, then it's just taking the norm of that. Uh, when you factor it out, as I showed you, get uh, you take that norm and expand it, and you can move around with it, and you can find a condition such that the more than epsilon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. That's. Yeah, interestingly, the that it looks based on the solution that that's uh, that's in the back. Yeah. Interestingly, the if you look at the solution at the end of the book, uh, their solution is actually a bit more like complicated because like in the first part that I just took, okay, it's just uh, smaller than the inverse of the norm of a inverse, uh, but they took uh, one half of that and like. I don't think it helps because it just may makes it a bit more. You have to do more work. Yeah, I I don't understand why they decided to have a solution that's less clean, but whatever. So yeah, I think that's like that was the the, the hardest exercises uh, exercise of that section. The rest is showing actually an example of uh, using the and there's an interesting example with connection of the exponential operator to uh, PDEs and differential equations. So and that that would be very interesting for Zoe because she's doing PDEs, but there's still a general 
fear of taking, okay, I have a PDE. Yeah, so they, yeah, they say, okay, we have a P, uh, like PDE and uh, we express it as an ODE, but where the, our X here is in a Banach space. And it's called an abstract differential equations because you're, in a sense, you're carrying the you're taking your function x, which is a function of time and space, and you're just saying, okay, um, I'm carrying it because now it's just a function of time, but the value of that function is a function of space. And if you are to do that, then you can also express the solution as the exponential operator and the, or the, the general generalization of that is called a C0 semi-group. Um, and there's, there's actually a whole theory of semi-group for PDEs and control, actually. You have any interest in either PDEs or that kind of stuff? It's it's actually quite a, you, you can go quite far. Yeah, so back to the example. This is actually exactly the example of the um, second order derivative and the time on the other hand, and they basically solve it in exactly that way. Although they they don't exactly yet the. Uh, eigenvector parts, but I think that'll go back to it in the section about spectral field. Yeah, that leaves the last exercise, which is maybe not the most interesting one, but it's about the exponential of a sum of operators, which is not always the product of both. And really it's not super long, but the idea is that you have, can have ill-behaved matrices like these, and they're the same matrices that cause problem for this part. And basically, the, the condition for by a to the uh, the exponential of a plus b be uh, equal to the product of the both exponentials is that a and b have to commute. That's the the, the real stuff here, and. Yeah, I think we've covered most of the beat of that section. It was not super long. Uh, I do control stuff, theory stuff in my job. Cool. Oh, you 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 should talk to Zoe then. Yeah, any other questions or exercises people wanted to do? Even in the non-speaking audience. Nothing on the actual material, but what do we uh, do? We want to take a look at next. Yeah, good question. Um, I've taken a look at the next one. It's a bit more abstract, and it says it's optional. So I, I'm not sure it's essential for the for the rest of the the group here because it's more. I can find the. Uh, yeah, it's. I don't think this section is super important, and I think maybe people will be more interested in the in, to jumping straight into the spectral theory, which is the, how do we find eigenvalues, eigenvectors for these operators. So I guess most people would probably want to move to 0.6, but that's up to people. Yeah, so I agree, probably. Probably jump ahead of 2.5 and just go ahead with 2.6. Okay, cool. Then one sec. And then um, do we want to do two weeks again just to let people have a breather or, or at least we have more people next time? Other than just lurkers? Sure. Two weeks works for me. Yep. Well then. Yeah, so short session and not super lively today, sorry. But uh, hopefully two weeks we'll have a livelier audience. So yeah, that was it. I mean, I can talk. I'm just in the airport. Yeah, but that, that means we can't talk a lot.
So anyway, so I think we're done here. So the two weeks with the section two point six, I'll, I'll handle the the um, um I I forgot the the words again. So I, I'll handle the scheduling. Scheduling, yes. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So. Bye. <laughs> also, all right. Hey, thank See you. you. Have a good week. Yeah. yeah. Thanks.